Hey guys, it's Julesy and we are back for another video. We are starting another critical conversation that I'm sure so many people are gonna have so many thoughts on and I just hope that we can all address each other respectfully because the idea of holding this conversation is to engage us and have us think more critically about how we are building community and the tools which we can do more work to build upon and to create safer and more compassionate communities for each other. I'm only hosting these conversations because black women are valuable and that's why I wanna have these more critical conversations. And I understand I totally understand. It is much easier to discuss the way people from outside the black woman community harm us because they absolutely do harm us often in much more violent ways. That doesn't mean the harm we casually throw at each other cannot or should not be discussed. And like, let me give this disclaimer here. I have been accused of not holding black women accountable in my uh the industry of shaming black women so if this is your first time ever seeing me go back and particularly watch that video because these are all built off of each other but i was accused of not holding black women accountable amongst many other things and firstly Accountability requires community. This discussion is set up on the understanding that black women are much more likely to be in community with each other rather than some random man who spends way too much time on the manosphere side of YouTube. My hope is that we amongst our chosen networks of friends and family will exercise the option to walk into being held accountable with each other once we come to better understandings of accountability and what tools that requires. People, especially people we have no direct access to, cannot be held accountable. Accountability is a process people walk into and that a community therefore supports the process of. And so let's go ahead and get into this topic of how black women harm black women and how we can start thinking about building out networks of accountability. trauma because of your intersectional identity, you are most likely to casually pass that trauma on to people who share the same identity as you. Then you stack on top of that the way that social hierarchy works. And that means people that are equal to you, oftentimes people that share the same identity as you, and then people that might rank lower on that hierarchy. So for black women, that would be children, non-binary, queer people, and those that exist in close proximity to us, we're also most likely for us to pass on trauma and oppress. Now, we all have root systems of harm in our lives, and those root systems can shape many of our emotional inabilities. And I say that because what I want us to first understand in this conversation before we start discussing all the other black women who have harmed us, because we're gonna get there, is to understand that we are all capable of harm and that there is no, oh, harm doer and survivor. There's not that binary doesn't exist. We are constantly shifting back and forth. And the idea is, can we become conscious of the ways in which we may be causing harm to others? And then if we all come to a better understanding, think about how our communities can transform. To make this in even simpler terms, when we think about root systems of harm, that we've, we've experienced things as children, as black women in this world, and all the trauma that, we've, uh, that we have absorbed, that trauma has become a part of our root system of how we interact and engage with other people. The assumptions, the perspectives, the lens at which we often look out into the outer world with has been shaped and impacted by the trauma and harm that has existed in our life from our birth on. So making that in even simpler terms for people that might think, well, you know, I, yeah, 
you know, even myself, I did not have a traumatic childhood. I have very positive memories of my childhood. I love both my parents. I still have very good relationships with all of my immediate family. Let's break this down to very basic things that a lot of us have had to go through and might not have acknowledged as part of our root systems. Let's start here. Do you know that you have the right to speak up, to change your mind, to communicate rather than hide? Even when that communication is going to have a negative reaction or a possible negative impact, that you have a right and actually a duty to speak up. Do you have the language? I'm thinking about, I have tried to collaborate with so many other black women. I have a book club and we have a cohort of about 20 black women who help me in very significant ways to run the book club. And I have noticed this one thing across trying to collaborate with content creators and even running the book club that just even this idea that I have agreed to do something and then something changes, something happens. You know, we hold so much stress in our bodies and it has neg like physical implications when we do that, right? And rather than say, all right, I see that I'm going down a pathway that's not gonna be sustainable. Let me reshift and let me change some things and let me communicate that I need this change in order to preserve my peace. Folks don't do that. It has been a common thing that I have had to tell people, you know, it is okay if we agree to do something now, especially if you're agreeing because we're standing face to face and you don't wanna hurt my feelings. But when you know that you're no longer gonna be able to fulfill that duty, just speak up because you have to give other people the autonomy and the space to be able to make the necessary change to complete whatever task we had all agreed upon. And instead what I have found that is it's common and even I've done this, you know, when I was younger and in my early 20s, that we arrive at a point of conflict and we hope nobody notices because we don't wanna to have to be the bearer of bad news because we hold so much shame internally that we are ashamed. <laughs> and, and, and you know what, it, it is, and I'm gonna be real with y'all, it is a very selfish outlook that many of us have had to have somebody pull us out of. Somebody had to come along and tell me that, hey, you can. there is a way in which you can communicate to address this issue, to take ownership, but also to alleviate yourself, right? And so that you don't have to hold all this guilt and shame because life happens and things do change. And rather than suffering through and hoping nobody notices and having people having to clean up the errors on the back end, and that there is language, right? And I'm, it's kind of hard for me to give you the exact language here because there's so many ways that this can manifest. But I know that so many of us have experiences that align with that and where we have passed on harm simply because we were never told how to do or say a thing or that that thing could be said or done, that we had a right to change our minds. And I've interacted with people who have believed that they can only speak up when they have absolute solutions. And one thing about being a black woman in this world, and really being an adult in this world, <laughs> is that very rarely are we gonna have the solutions to any problem. But what we can do is be in constant communication and in honest communication with each other and give each other the opportunity to come in and be the support that's needed. But when we hide, we harm. The example that I was just giving, right, is something that I would actually term as casual harm. And some of the harm, particularly this casual trauma that we can even correlate back to our childhood and the way we were talked to and the way people expressed us, whether we grew up never thinking that we were attractive, whether we our understanding of beauty was rooted in anti-blackness because of people, the way people talked about our hair or our facial features or our skin color. And then having to work through that trauma Nobody experiences harm for the first time when they're doing the harm. We've all been harmed previously, which is how we are constantly passing on and replicating this harm. One thing I also want to acknowledge is that it is extremely hard to be introspective when you are simply trying to survive, which is why I have been committed to doing the work to help curate, you know, with like the book club. 
um, like if I'm going to ask people to be in an examined state, I also have to understand that various members of that cohort sit at various intersections of identity. And the more intersections you sit at, the more you are going to be fighting for your own survival. And it is hard to be introspective when you are having hard, a hard time surviving. What we can do to become better people, to become better friends, if these are people that we really wanna hold in community with each other, how are we creating safety, love, and compassion and it gets really tricky like this is not an easy conversation to have but when you add the idea of i'm not only a black woman but i am disabled i am non-binary or i am queer or i am a multitude of any things the more you add on the harder people are going to be fighting for their survival and if we at least want to mitigate the harm that we are passing on to each other we have to be mindful of how much we are fighting for our survival. And are we being compassionate? Are we being loving? Are we keeping people safe? And it is something that we absolutely have to be invested in. Otherwise, all we're going to do is continue to harm each other. We can become better people once we have been given the space to process our trauma. Now, before I land with, okay, that means go to therapy, because we all know that like everyone loves to say go to therapy, but therapy isn't accessible for a lot of people. The cost, the finding someone who has a cultural competency and awareness to speak to your direct issues. I mean, we have definitely weaponized the language of therapy, which is something I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on. And we often invoke this ideal of therapy without acknowledging the overall inaccessibility of said therapy, especially for multi-hyphenate, multi-identity people. Being invested in people's safety really is a thing we're going to have to do that creates better, more accountable communities. I'm saying like, some people are invested in doing um, community outreach work. But most of us, this means being invested in the safety of our friends and family, being invested in the safety of people within our immediate sphere of influence. At minimum, we will, st if we take on that work, you will see a great shift in your community. I really want to encourage us to divert from the way we dispose of people. So much of the language that we use when it comes to the even the idea that we currently have of accountability, the idea of keeping our individual self safe relies on the disposal of people and a carceral, which means a reliance on the police state and jailing and putting people behind bars. You want to put a person in jail because they owed you money. You want to have somebody shot because they lied to you. We often seek, we don't seek accountability. We very often, even amongst each other, seek punishment. We seek to power and dominate each other. And we're seeking the same thing that is rooted in why we are so often causing harm to each other. Part of that is because of the messaging that we absorb. We absorb so much messaging that informs us that we should be looking at our relationships in a transactional, in a purely transactional, aspect and I really feel like the prevalence and the you know it's not that this is some like new messaging this idea that your relationships can fulfill transactional needs the way that the conversations peak and come back up is because we are trying to address a societal lacking a societal issue via transactional relationships with other individuals. A lot of the transactional messaging is around romantic relationships, but it absolutely triples over into how we view our family, friends, and platonic relationships. And again, you know, we are thinking, oh, I'm gonna get my housing, my food, get fed, get clothing, emotional labor, beauty products, get my hair did, because I, this is what that friend does for me. It becomes what they do for you and it becomes transactional and it doesn't really become about respect, love, and safety. Even this idea that our friends should be, all our friends should be so absolutely business minded and entrepreneurial so that if we have our own business, they can support us towards our success, that they will be the foundation of our success. And I think the black women empowerment movement is such a great example of specifically what I'm talking about right here of black women celebrating the ideals of wealth and power and harming each other in the process. We got this whole past weekend of Karen Civil. And Jesse Wu, and it's, girl, 
It is the center of this idea that I can position myself as wealthy and knowledgeable because of all this wealth that I've amassed and then say that I'm the person that's helping all these black women when in the background, I'm just stealing from them. <laughs> I'm just scamming them and I'm getting away with that scamming because I could turn around and will say, well, I'm a black woman and I'm of an immigrant household and I'm going through all these things too. N no, and then we, we use oh man there's actually a whole bunch of terminology about like this victim complex and weaponizing our identity against people of shared identities to remove ourselves from accountability and we see that happen so so often and we receive so much messaging that shows us that people doing that that we feed into that and we are very often encouraged to use the tools of patriarchy and misogyny for us to gain proximity to power by gaining access to male dominated spaces Mm, black women empowerment. Yeah, we. I still gotta do a whole video on that. Let's get into some definitions. Let's start defining, defining language so we can really get into the weeds of this. I want to define harm and distinguish it from abuse because it's important we thoroughly understand what harm is so we can work to remove the stigma away from being held accountable for harm, especially as we are all at some point in time going to be the harm doers. I'm going to pull a definition from Deshaun Harrison's blog post that harm is a one-time act of violence or infliction of pain that can be either intentional or unintentional. Abuse is continued and repeated force of violence that mistreats, mishandles, or exploits someone's body, being, and or feelings. It is about a commitment interrogated or uninterrogated to enforcing violence onto someone else with no interest of stopping. Harm is a one-time act of violence or infliction of pain that can either be intentional or unintentional. Abuse is continued or repeated with no interest in stopping. Very clear, very precise. Also, Sarah Schulman points out in Conflict is Not Abuse, Overstating Harm, Community, Responsibility, and the Duty of Repair, that sometimes invoking the language of abuse is actually an avoidance of responsibility. And we need those definitions so that we can understand that we are all, again, I'm going to say it time and time again, we are all culpable and capable of harming each other. But if we can become aware of that capability and that culpability, it's what do we do with that awareness that matters most? When you are accused of being a harm doer, because we have now defined harm versus abuse, it does not mean that you are a bad person. You can and you absolutely will harm people even if you are deeply invested in being a kind person. Many of us do not process our emotions root system again, we do not process those emotions. So how are we going to process the harm we've done if we only know how to internalize everything, if you constantly hold on to internalizing yourself as Ugh, how dare someone accuse me of being a bad person. And I think that reaction is rooted in not having a space to process your feelings, your emotions, the, the trauma you've already experienced, that it's a shock to learn that you have hurt someone and now you don't have any process or ways to work through those this uncomfortable feelings, to hold the tension necessary, to interrogate your own actions, because you don't interrogate anything, you just internalize. And a lot of us do that. That's a call out on myself. And in order to have this process where we can examine, where we can interrogate, where we can work to become better peoples, you absolutely need the tools of community to do that. There is no doing that on your own. And I think because societally we are struggling with survival and there are so many things happening that are outside of our control that this message of isolation and being by yourself has really won out because we're being informed that life should go a certain way. And if life is not going that way for you, don't even think about societally what's happening that's causing these barriers of entry. No, it's all on you. You're at fault. That's the wrong messaging. Right there, there is, you know, I'm always talking about the matrix of domination because Dr. Patricia Hill Collins talks about this in black feminist thought, but you know, there are so many institutions that constantly replicate themselves to 
keep people oppressed. We, we live in a capitalistic society and system that requires us to be the labor, not the owners of said labor, but the labor, the means of production. Ugh. I want to encourage us that community really is important and building community means that we're all going to have to put in the effort to build the community of people that we want to be in community with but that also means that we have to this and this is what you know when we talk about divesting from capitalism it is divesting from this idea that you need to be wealthy or you're the failure that if people don't show a certain economic status they are not worthy of love and compassion that if you cannot work to the bone that if you can't the letting go of this hustle mentality work letting go of this idea that you do not have the right to rest to sleep to curating peace Right? Capitalism has absolutely informed us that our bodies are a utility and that if we do not fulfill the utility of making other people wealthy, we have failed. Y'all, that's what I want people to divest from. I want us to divest from this idea of seeking power and domination over people that we want to be in community with and rather really working towards fostering communities of safety, of love and compassion. Many of us are dealing with a form of complex post traumatic stress disorder. A psychological disorder that can develop in response to prolonged, repeated experiences of interpersonal trauma in a context in which the individual has little or no chance of escape. So you think about a lot of black women and black queer folk and you know various other people that exist at multitudes of intersections as people of color, especially you know when we're children, when we live in households and we are told and said there are certain things and we don't have the access or the ability to leave that environment that we, we have to grow up and we're fostered in these environments. And Shaheem, who is a clinical therapist and social worker, very visible on TikTok, actually has a playlist uh, that breaks down CPTSD and the four F trauma responses that are correlated to CPSD. Mm, definitely get into that. But the CPTSD, right? And this idea that like we as children were informed on how we should engage with the outer world. And a lot of us grew up being informed that we should lie, that we should hide who we are, that we should say what people wanna hear, that we should always present as respectable, you know, there's so many respectability politics, especially for black women that are caught up in this, but we should present as respectable, nice, very soft black women and never engage in ways that can fit outside of this very binary understanding of who we should show up in the world as. And so that means that a lot of us lie to each other. We lie to our friends, we lie to our families, we lie to people that we say we care about. Not confronting conflicts because of time, because of discomfort, because we don't wanna, because we don't have a solution or not wanting to rock the boat or change the mood. So we stay quiet. I know things are not ethical right now, but I don't wanna rock the boat. I don't want to be the person that is changing the mood. So many of us have been informed that we need to quiet ourselves, that we need to make ourselves small in order to be accepted. And then we end up harming each other in the process because not saying anything, saying yes to everything, investing in things that you don't really wanna be invested in are also a form of lying. And it could be very harmful to the people that we're engaging with. I wanted to get back to the, the point on therapy because we so often now in this age of social media are actually weaponizing therapy by using the language of therapy without investing in the labor of how, how is therapy a useful tool for us to process and work through the traumas and our emotions and feelings and come become whole. Weaponizing means that we are using language developed for a deeper understanding of self experiences than the traumas and emotional results of life to avoid accountability and to manipulate or harm others. We weaponize the language of therapy because we're not actually doing the work of therapy. Therapy is a journey that requires our labor. And it does not mean that you simply end a session with your therapist and then turn around and tweet of something because this aha moment that I had in therapy makes for a great viral moment. And then we try to suggest that we are better people simply because we received what our therapist said, but did you do the work? Babes, did you do 
the work. A theory that can come out of therapy is this idea that it's okay to be the bad guy in someone else's story. What that means is it's okay to acknowledge the harm that you may have done. Not that you dismiss how someone else who's claiming harm feels. As people who are constantly transitioning between harm doers and survivors, being okay to be the bad guy in someone else's story means that we're okay receiving that we may have caused someone else harm. That our knee-jerk reaction isn't, oh, how dare you accuse me of something. It is that we have the tools of community to process what may or may not have happened and how we can become better people and how we can do better and the lessons that we can learn from that. Not that we puff our chest out and say, well, it's okay that I lied to you because you were never worthy of being honest to in the first place. That's the work of therapy. But so many of us, especially in this world of content creators, get on here and we get access to therapy and our therapist says something that sounds so cool. We may write about it in a journal. We may cry about it a little bit in the car afterwards, but we don't do the work and then we immediately use it as ways to make ourselves appear to be more intelligent, more worthy people. In the process of that, we very often are replicating the harm over and over again. And we're not actually holding ourselves accountable. We're not actually building communities of safety, of love and compassion. If you love and care for a person, and if you ever wanna believe that you were ever close with the person, you will choose to walk in accountability. Part of that process is doing the work of therapy, not just making it a viral moment. On the flip side though, because I know plenty of people are going to be inclined to share their own stories of how people have harmed them and how wrong and harmful other people have been to them. But we cannot frame accountability as a transactional or carceral process if the end goal is better and safety communities. As I said before, you know, we receive so much languaging that encourages us to dispose of people, to rely on a carceral, like punishing approach. That does not create better safety communities because it doesn't distill the root of why those things are happening. It doesn't get to the root system at all. I said so many times in this video already that we all have the ability to cause harm, but that also means that we do have the ability to repair the part of us that leads to harm. I would actually love for us to get to a point of accountable communities where we can rely on calling in because so often call outs happen because of the power dynamic, because we have no accountability. And so we call out because we want to publicly shame. We call out because we want people to know and be aware because we have no other system of accountability to engage with. And if we can get to building out these communities of safety, compassion, love, and accountability, then call-ins, can much more effectively happen. Accountability really isn't publicly admonishing someone as owing you a thing, but accountability is a process for repair that is transformative. And if we have the means and the access and the privilege of therapy, we have great even, you know, that is part of that transformative process. That's a process. It's not a tweet or a viral moment. And in the ideal of building these communities with each other, if we are conscious of the harm and we make efforts to reduce it, that is the best thing that we can truly do for each other. I've also understood that there's been situations where I have felt that I have been harmed and I have also in return harmed people back because it's not always black and white. And there are things that we can both do to address the harm and to become better people and to reduce the harm going forward. I mentioned this book previously, but Sarah Shulman's Conflict Is Not Abuse is a great book to get into. I have listened to this book on Audible. Oh guys, you know, shout out to Audible because you know, it has helped me get through so much reading. I'm back in school full time. It has been very hectic out here, but audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy to 500, 500 to get your first month free on Audible, get you into these audio books. They are amazing. But Sarah Shulman's Conflict Is Not abuse is that girl it's that book and it really I've referenced this book in other videos especially when I start thinking about community when I think about people trying to attack me and come for me and when I want to think about how what is my role in 
um, building community and fostering community and how do I deal with conflict and how do I deal with being called out and how can I address wanting to be called in rather than called out, yada, yada, yada. This book has been amazing. It really, really, really talks about the dangers of overstating harm community responsibility and the duty of repair. And it's a great listen if you wanna come to a better understanding of building a safe community that has the processes of accountability built into it, which makes it therefore the safe community. Loved this book, get into it. Also, this might seem like a bit more of a uh, outsider book, but Akweke Emise's Freshwater, which is also a book I did on Audible. Akweke themselves narrates the book, and I think their slight uh, Nigerian accent really helps bring the book to life. Because in the book, it, it's addressing the splintering of the mind in response to trauma. One spirit seeks to dominate via sex and femininity. Another spirit, one of three prominent spirits, works to balance out the other two as the main character, the Ada's journey into their non-binary identity um, comes to life. And you see what is very clearly an internal struggle happening. I mean, Akweke's writing is just, I really was thinking about people that I've interacted with that I might want to accuse as harm doers myself, but then understanding, you know, the things that they had made be going through, the ways that we are all trying to respond to the trauma that we have absorbed as child children. And how we have internalized that and how it, it lands us with how we interact with each other now. It really illuminates very clearly the internal struggle of what it means to be traumatized um, by so many people just along the way and how we kind of reinvest in that trauma. And because we are in the Ada's mind, a lot of the actions that the Ada takes in the book that can be read or that if you were experiencing it on the other side of it, right? You might want to heighten the language you use to explain your interaction with said person. But because you're in the Ada's mind, you get to see the splintering of their mind. And you come to understand how the trauma that the Ada experiences spills out onto the people that they are closest with. It is a beautiful read and an amazing listen. And I absolutely wanna thank Audible for allowing me to produce this video. As always, if it is your first month on Audible, audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy to 500-500 and get your first month free on Audible. I just finished Opal and Nev on Audible if you're looking for something a little bit more lighthearted because this was a very heavy topic and absolutely enjoyed it. And then I'm about to go back and listen to The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. That's really, if you, if you need something fun, you need some fun because I made you feel heavy. Get get the secret lives of church ladies on Audible. It's like a soap opera and it's easy breezy and great. And then come join the SVG book club and talk about us, talk to us about these books. As always, I hope I made sense. I hope there was something to take from this. And I hope that we can all work towards investing in just being better people by becoming aware of the ways that we can cause harm and working to reduce it.